Okay, so we're here for another discussion, another uh, sculpture forum discussion. Um, uh, unfortunately, we're having to do this by Zoom, so we'll do the best we can. Um, and we're going to be talking about the work from the Sahel that was at the Metropolitan Museum until fairly recently. And I think I managed to see it, see that exhibition before lockdown. And then it opened up again uh, briefly, and I think everybody has seen the show. I'm here with um, Frank Jonsu, uh, Jock Ireland, and we've invited for this particular discussion, Lee Tribe. We've invited Lee because Lee, I think, knows more about work from the African continent than the rest of us do. Oh, and by the way, I should credit uh, Rochelle Bolander, who is uh, now recording this and who will edit it and may chip in with a word here and there. Um, so uh, Lee also, uh, apart from the knowledge that he has, which is way in excess of what I have and I, what I believe Jock and Brand have about work from the African continent, as a collection, a fairly significant collection of work from Africa that he owns. Um, so that's our, our reason for inviting him, other than that he's a delightful person and a good friend and I wanted to see him. Um, so I, I, I am actually very nervous about talking about this work. Um, I, I'm nervous about it. I mean, I'm aware, I'm aware, I'm very aware, of course, that the work from the African continent has been tremendously uh, influential in the evolution of sculpture in Europe, uh, and I guess in America too, uh, particularly in the early part of the 90, early 1900s. I mean, one thinks of Picasso and, and I would presumably include Brancusi. Um, and, that, and that influences that is, is tremendously important. And to that extent, I suppose, you know, some, some aspects of, of the tradition from the African continent have been incorporated into, into our own tradition uh, and, and enriched it enormously. Nevertheless, I am nervous about talking about this work because it seems to bring my criteria to it is, is, is in some ways uh, questionable when I don't know the criteria that the, the makers of these objects were using and, and or, 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 you know, what they, what, how the audience for these objects responded to them or whether the audience had the same criteria as the makers or what, you know, I mean, there's just a whole mass of, of, of knowledge, experience, awareness that I don't have and, 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 and may not ever be able to have it, and a lot of it may not be available. But nevertheless, it does seem, I just say it worries me to be talking about it when all I have is my own practice basically to bring to it, which is a very, come from a very different place than what I understand the makers of these things were coming from and the reasons they were using to make them and the criteria they were using and so on. So anyway, having said that, um, we are looking at, we talk, as we talk, at some um, uh, footage uh, and photographs of the objects. And so let's go. I mean, Lee, would you like to start us off having um, been invited here for this particular <laughs> forum? Yep. Yep, I will uh, say some words. Um, you, I, I agree with you um, about um, the lack of knowledge that we have, and some of it will never, um, we will never know. It can be guessed at or aimed at, but um, so I, I come to it personally as, um, a collector and a sculptor. And I've always been a collector. As a child, I lived near the uh, Docklands of London and I was always picking up matchbox tops and things like that. I also was um, 
once in a while I would see something either on the ships where I went with my father, even as a little boy, um, where they had African crew. And I would see things, masks, and the, all the, um, the sailors that had settled down in the area as well had things. You'd go into people's houses and it wasn't um, unexpected to see something from Africa or, or India or, or wherever they'd been and brought back souvenirs and keepsakes. So um, when I laid up, I used to carve wood a little bit when I was an apprentice in the docks. When I was waiting for um, another trade to show up, I would whittle wood. And um, the things I whittled somehow echoed these um, tribal pieces. You know, my interpretation, my very naive interpretation um, so they've been on my mind for a very long time. And there's, there's what they are as sculpture and what they are in a collection. And the joy of finding something that you can include in your collection and live with, that's um, a very important part of it for me. Um, I don't try to uh, literally take anything from them in um, a clear and thought out manner. If I, anything turns up in my work that I think relates to them, I let it exist. And it does turn up quite a lot because I look, I've look. i looked at so much and uh, lived with them for a long time, which is one of the reasons I wanted to collect them in the first place. And I've thought so much about them, how they would have um, impacted the uh, the art of the early 1900s in Paris mainly and around, but the, you know that obvious moment when um, they seem to offer a way out of the uh, academic um, translations of particularly in sculpture, but also in painting, um, and uh, and I wondered if if how we see them now is different to how people like Picasso and Matisse and Brancusi, who kind of on and off denied uh, being influenced by them or his critics pushed it that way, especially the Romanian critics. Um, but I think he was definitely in for it. He could, there was no way he couldn't be being in Paris at that time with the things that were coming in in and being seen and shown and in collections of other artists. And I wonder if now, after um, the advent of non-representation in art, do we see them differently now? This is a question I'm forever asking myself. And when I realized that I'd be talking here, I began to ask it again. And I think we do see them differently now. I think, the, the inventive aspect of the human figure, the way that forms meet. Um, uh, like this little one here now, that, that's almost not a figure, but it's so beautiful as a form. So this kind of abstraction, but still within the confines of a tradition that would have been passed down even before they had the written word, they would be passed down visually and orally. And, and the culture goes back very, very far. And that fascinates me. The, and within the tradition, the prescribed style of the piece, there is invention within the tradition. Like this piece here is quite inventive in its form in the curve and they're the kind of things that really interest me so does anyone else want to throw in a few penneth now well i i i i i mean i don't want to keep anybody out but i just wanted to respond to what you said lee and thank you very much for that it's, it's interesting but the the question of invention you know is something that i've wondered about a great deal and to the to what extent i mean one of the things that, that i'm I've been kind of found myself 
thinking about in relation to this exhibition and this work, I mean, um, you know, is, is the extent to which there was complete harmony between the makers and the, and the, and the audience, the viewers, the users of these things, the extent to which there was some kind of friction as there has been in, you know, in, in, in relation to sculpture in the West. I mean, we are not by any means at, at one with, with, you know, the, the, what we might consider the general uh, audience. Um, uh, and, and I wonder, you know, to what extent, uh, you know, invention uh, shifts in the, in, in, in the development, evolution of the tradition were welcomed or, or were met with hostility, uh, that kind of thing. Anyway, um, you know, and as you said, I mean, importantly, I think we, we will just perhaps never know some of these some answers to some of these questions and I don't know, you know, but, but um, uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, looking at some of those images, not the clay things, obviously, but the fact that they're carved from a tree, a piece of wood, a tree trunk, um, limits what they can do. They're usually, like even in their prayer stance, is the vertical stance with the arms raised, raised mm -hmm. and they're, they're reaching up to the sky in a prayer for rain and fertility when they do that in the Dogon pieces, um, which a lot of these are, and the Tellum pieces, um, which are somehow related to the Dogon. I've never really fully understood the true relationship. There are myths and stories, but it is their belief, it is their religion, the Nomo, uh, the founding humans. And then there's various stories which would have been passed on orally with the sculpture as an illustration of their ancestors. And then later you've got um, the influence of Islam pushing them and they actually moved into this area. Um, I think they were, um, they, to, to, to retain their own beliefs, they moved to the area around the Bandigiara escarpment, um, I believe, if I said it right, um, to get away from the, I think it was the Filoni tribe that were trying to convert them to Islam. So they, that has been part of that Sahel um, uh, conflict and influence from probably from Egypt even, because there are some thoughts that um, some of the, the Dogon figures, the, 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 uh, the man and woman are like the Pharaoh and his wife. So there's, they, they, there is some talk that they could be influenced mm. by um, Egypt, Egyptian sculpture. And they also have, there's a, a lot of, um, stuff that I, it's a bit too, um, it's not really something I can get my head around, but their cosmology as well. Um, the stars and things, the way they align their villages. It's a pretty complex business. Yeah, I'm sure. Jock, Brent. The thing that um, attracted me about the show was uh, uh, was that well the 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 work that I liked best uh, was the clay pieces uh, and uh, and and there's uh, there and, and I I refer to the clay pieces as Jenna terracottas because I heard that somewhere. Uh, and there's a Jenna terracotta in the permanent collection of the Met that is, or that has always um, uh, attracted me. And uh, so I was excited to see the show and see more of that kind of stuff. Uh, the sh show turned out to be uh, 
well, the, just the clay pieces were significantly different from this piece in the permanent collection. But uh, the piece in the permanent collection for me is uh, connected to specifically Nicole Eisenman. Everybody knows Nicole. She's spoken at the studio school, a painter mostly, uh, but she started to make sculpture, sculpture that is uh, formally very much like this Gen A terracotta. Uh, and uh, it's that sort of contemporary dimension of at least the clay pieces in the show that really, uh, I don't know, floored me, that uh, left me feeling that this is the sort of most significant sculpture show that I saw this year, certainly. Uh, but it, that it's, and uh, yeah, that it, it's, I found, you know, complete ignorance, but uh, real emotional connection to some of this work. Uh, and uh, and I, I don't know, I feel a bit alone in this uh, connection or whatever, that I, my response to uh, the work. Uh, and the difficulty, you know, Garth, you talk about having trouble talking about this stuff, uh, I, you know, as I'm making clear now, I'm, <clears throat> I can't talk about it very effectively, but I, it really hit me uh, uh, emotionally, those, uh, uh, those, you know, amazing clay figures um, that are, um, uh, you know, people, there's speculation that uh, they were made around the time of some sort of cataclysmic event, uh, maybe climate related, maybe uh, maybe climate related, maybe disease related, and and the response to that, uh, the and the sort of complex emotional response and collective response. Uh, you, you know, it seems to be a real, Garth, you were talking about a friction between the audience and the makers. They, they don't have any sense of friction with these things. These things came from the whole community. Uh, and, and that it, it's, yeah, they came from the whole, uh, the whole community in response to something that everybody understood then and that we we don't know. We have no idea whether it was disease or climate or what. Uh, but I, I, in spite of not knowing this, I, I do feel that I know exactly what they're talking about. Uh, uh, that they're, uh, they speak directly to me in the 21st uh, century. Yeah, well, this is the kind of um, kind of response that I'm unable to have and very wary of having. Um, and, 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 you know, the, the, that sense that, that these speak uh, for, for a kind of, that these objects have a kind of collective voice rather than an individual voice is something also that which you just articulated something also that I'm unsure about I mean I mean that would seem possibly to be the case because they you know um, are embedded in a tradition that we don't know and for the most part we don't identify individual makers uh, of these things um, Lee also raised the question uh, about whether we see them now very differently to how they would have been seen in the early 1900s when they were just beginning to be, you know, uh, fairly ubiquitously present and brought back by missionaries and things as, you know, yeah, but as, it, as curiosities rather than as works of art. 
Um, I, I don't know whether we, I think we must see them differently because, because they are now comparatively familiar. Um, and 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 you know they don't they they wouldn't have the kind of impact of the strangeness that they would have had for people, uh, especially artists, you know, who 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 evolved a tradition very differently. Um, yeah, some and, of the things are familiar, but I'd never seen this this clay work, uh, certainly, and I'm not sure that the guys at the beginning of the 20th century uh, saw the, you know, everything that's in this show. No. Uh, uh, but the thing is, every, you know, next week, we're all going to be looking at everything we look at differently. Uh, you know, whether it's African sculpture or Rembrandt's paintings, everything changes with time. You can't, there's no sort of right way of looking at this or that. It, it, we're all caught up in uh, different moments. And, and even when we talk about it, we distort things. Because I, I see, a, you know, some of your work, you, you know, you are reluctant to talk about these things, but that there's a dimension of your sculpture that is connected to this work that, uh, uh, seems to me to be significant, and you know, just to Nicole Eisenman and and a, a whole lot of work that is described as abject, uh, or just just the sense in which things uh, today aren't idealized the way they might have been in ancient Greece or Rome or Renaissance Italy. There's that's a direct sort of clear uh, uh, connection that we, or at least I'm sort of relaxed about insisting upon. Um, I felt uh, much more like a tourist at this exhibition um, than I remember feeling at, you know, any other. Um, and I, I usually don't have quite that feeling, but the, the, the heterogeneity and the, like the small community and rapidly changing history of this area seemed to me so, uh, you know, so multitudinous, so circumstantially complex that I really was very aware that I had no real grip on the on the history and and on the many separate distinct cultures involved and i felt that the layout of the exhibition you know although i didn't read all the wall text the layout of the exhibition didn't help me over that hurdle at the same time i've always really kind of prized the isolation of an art object in an exhibition the, the kind of uh, radical, stringent, you know, almost ruinous separation of the thing from its origins. So that in, that in itself is not a problem for me. It's more of a, th a thrill. And it, the kind of uh, unexpected thought that I had about this was that um, I asked myself, how different was this experience from my experience of the work of other um, times and places that I'm far more familiar with? But in fact, you know, in principle, in practical terms, I'm really, I'm very nearly just as distant. You know, like I, I happen to really like classical Mediterranean art and, you know, I've read about it, et cetera, et cetera, you know, visited a bit. And, but in real terms, um, you know, I'm still so far from anything like being there. 
And what I've learned has made that more distinct and upfront than ever in, in my own mind. So I think that in fact, all people everywhere at any given time face the outside world in a very, from a very similar perspective, from a similar kind of distance. I think it's endemic to the human condition. And, and it strikes me as well that I feel kind of the same uh, distance, not to call it alienation, I mean, from my own youth, which was not that long ago. But I'm a, my per, I'm a quite different person and my perspective is quite different. You know, and I pray every day that it'll be different by every morning, that it'll be different by evening. So I, I think that, that none of us really uh, should or, or can shrink from confronting distant work because it's just integrally our human condition. And our, our lives are so, you know, vastly diminished if we don't engage. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, you said you felt like a tourist. I mean, I didn't exactly feel like a tourist, but what, what the exhibition did leave me with was, was or, or what I felt in there, in the, in the galleries was, a, you know, a desperate kind of awareness of my ignorance and my hunger for, for knowledge about, about the context, about the people, about the reasons, about the criteria, about the use. Uh, I, I mean, I, I, I just felt, you know, that I was responding to these things as a sculptor in many cases you know, thinking, oh my God, that is wonderful. But then thinking, well, what am I saying? What am I saying? Well, you know, what, what does that mean? Um, and, 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 you know, I mean, I, I imagine, and Lee, you must tell me, I mean, I imagine that to some extent these things were made in order to have an effect, in order to produce some real world uh, consequences. Um, one of the things that I learned from, uh, from uh, Lisa Lagana's lecture at the studio school was that some of these objects were not on public view, that they were kept out of sight and brought out annually to be, to be viewed, and that this was an important occasion. I loved that. I thought that, you know, wouldn't that be marvelous if we had, if we, you know, if sculpture in the West was not on public view, but was brought out occasionally to be seen and then put away again. <laughs> anyway, that, you know, anyway, I mean, I, that was, my sense was, was, where, where, you know, where, 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 where Jock, you seem to have been moved by these things and, and felt, and felt, that, you know, that that was an important experience and, and one that you could somehow or other cherish. I felt moved by them, but I felt also kind of, uh, questioning what it was that I was, you know, the, how, you know, given, I mean, I wanted to know uh, much more to somehow test what it was I was experiencing. If that makes any sense to anybody. Yeah, it, it does. And, and Garth, I got to say, it's a kind of, uh, you know, that's the, the kind of thing in you that I that you know I esteem and admire. That that those are serious questions and they're emotional questions for you, and yeah. I feel that they're 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 fundamental questions. Yeah, I mean, it's not like going into a gallery in New York, a, a temporary sculpture, where I feel somehow that, you know, although it's not it's not. You know, it's not a, a, something I can assume automatically, but I can try to sort of put myself in the place of the maker, and mm -hmm. I can't here, and that's my problem. Lee. Yes, the maker is from another culture, um, obviously, and obviously um, we are not privy to that. The, um, the, the culture in Africa, 
black sculptors um, following their their um, the things they're taught, the ceremonies, the um, the power in society. It's all part of that. That's the part. The thing you said about Elisa bring you know, that mentioned that they bring them out for once a year or twice a year for special occasions illustrates in a way the power that they have and they maintain it I believe by not having them out in public view all the time that's a social power but there is an inherent power in the sculptures that seems in my experience and the things I've noticed is that some pieces of African sculpture and sculpture from many other places separate out and are they, they carry this emotional content and way of being a presence which is admired by practically everyone. The, the, you can look at them and sense their power with no knowledge of the reason that they exist. And that is one of the things that fascinates me. Yeah, and I should just chuck in that Elisa Lagama is doing a, a fantastic job at the Met and we're very lucky to have her there because she's putting on fantastic, very selected and intelligently chosen shows to, to, to establish these different cultures in a particular way with a lot of respect. And I am humbled by that, by her efforts and the shows she puts on. Yeah, I think we're very lucky. Her knowledge is is so uh, much appreciated, and and yeah, I I, I share that. Um, uh, no, what you what you just said, Lee, about the power of these things, you know, existing somehow or other independently of. Of, of the context for which they were made is, 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 is the nub of the matter, I think, you know. Um, how, how do they, how, how do they, what is it about them that, that uh, it enables us, you, and I don't disagree with your statement, enables that statement to be made. You know that they have a power which transcends the context they do. To them. and i think it's a multiplicity of things but essentially it touches something of the human condition that we are all human we're just people and that's in even this weathered one that's here um it's so beautiful weathered away nature has carved that one but it still retains that power. And um, also it gives it an individuality. These are quite interesting as well. These mother and child things. I know in the Sanufu people, a child is considered unformed as a human until it drinks from the mother's breast, the mother's milk. Um, and that one, that that seemed to carry on in that one because that little head there was kind of um, lacking in features of the human characteristic, you know, a baby. It was very, a very stylized head where the mother wasn't. And there's all these little things in them, little codes, little clues that the people who understand them, who they were made for, would be able to read very clearly. And when you were talking about bringing things out, Christianity does that a bit, not in the Mediterranean countries. They have processions where they carry the saints. And that's kind of interesting. Yeah. See yeah, that, that I just... little head there? You see, yeah. it's, a, it's yeah. an unformed human. Yeah. And you're <laughs> not, until you drink from the mother, you are not fully formed. I think it's kind of beautiful. Mm. Poetic. 
And there's right. Brancusi too, right there. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, but it that's the kind of African art that we're familiar with. Uh, and this power uh, word and knowledge, uh, they, these, uh, I'm uncomfortable with <laughs> those things. It, that, it's not that they're not powerful sculpture, but at least the clay pieces are interesting to me in that they're, they're, there were a bunch of them that are sort of all the same, kind of mass produced, only not mass produced. You know, it was, I, I think there's speculation that women made these things. And, and it's not, I mean, there were some powerful uh, clay pieces that, you know, spectacular craftsmanship and whatnot, but the, the plainness uh, of many of the clay pieces uh, and, and the kind of lack of impressive power made them, uh, and, and that's what you see in Nicole Eisenman. She, and she deliberately uh, rejects any kind of skill or in the making of her sculpture. I, you know, I'm oversimplifying and whatnot, but that uh, there is a, it, you know, there is a dimension uh, to African art that is uh, that is kind of unwestern in its in the Western insist insistence on uh, you know genius and power and uh, and even the Western insistent on insistence on knowledge is. You have to know. You don't. I, why do you have to know anything about this stuff? I, you know, may, maybe Rachel could chip in in that she's, uh, you know, younger than the rest of us. And it, it, you know, did do you need or did you need to know stuff about this stuff, Rachel, or that you yeah, well, that you didn't already know? <laughs> One good thing about not having um, the extensive education and background and experience that you all do is just about everything I look at is new. So in a lot of respects, this wasn't any different to me than the first time I really looked at, say, like a David Smith sculpture, which was just, you know, maybe four or five years ago. So I tend to approach everything with, I don't know much about this. Um, so you do, it's like, does it resonate? And then you ask, why does this resonate with me or why not? Um, and you kind of divorce it from its context. So I, I don't have an issue with not really knowing much about it. I, I do feel it is my responsibility afterwards to take the time to read about the people and the cultures that created them. And you know, how, how it was that they ended up at the Met, because um, I think that's important. But in terms of trying to understand the sculpture, you understand it for its form. And you ask all the same questions of it that you would any other art or sculpture that you approach. I mean, that's at least how I do it. Well, I, I, I mean, I, Jock, I, I'm not sure that I needed to know so much as that I wanted to know. I mean, I, you know, I come to these things the way I come to things elsewhere, as, as Rachel was just saying. I mean, I, you know, look at the object and I'm saying to myself, you know, who are you? What were you thinking? What did this mean to you? What did it, who were you making it for? What, you know, that, those are the questions that, you know, that, I mean, and, 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 you know, when I look at a David Smith, I can begin to kind of like answer some of those questions for myself. But when I come to these things, I'm lost. And that was my experience. You know, not, it wasn't that, that, that I, I, you know, I needed to know, but these things were moving me, touching me. And so those questions, the inability to somehow to begin to formulate answers to those questions left me, you know, in a very uncomfortable place. 
the the things weren't able to answer the questions themselves to some extent. I mean, not to sufficiently, it, not not to a way where I could kind of begin begin to interrogate them more fully. No. no. Yeah, for me, um, the collector in me is very interested in acquiring the knowledge of why. Why is that? Why is that? It also protects you from buying fakes a little bit. And when you're putting your money in it, it's something, you know, you want to be careful with because if you can catch one out from something that's going on in the sculpture, it could save you quite a lot of money. But the, but the collector informs the sculptor in me as well. Um, I just think it's a wonderful, wonderful experience to be amongst these things. And to, to ask ourselves those kind of questions, the questions that you all ask, Garth asks, the, uh, the clay things, you're right. They, uh, I think Elisa said it was from the 14th to the 17th century, there was a kind of a bounty of these being produced. And I wonder about it because I wonder if water's something to do with it. This was a very arid region, clay needs water. Stuff like that, you know, is there some kind of symbolism there? Um, I know that the, they pray for water. Um, so it's things, it's stuff like that. I, some of the clay things I think are absolutely sublime. I have a little uh, Sugu piece that is, I like it, I love it as much as anything else that I have. It's just a, a little figure in a kneeling position. You know, the way they work with clay is the way, it, you know, it carries the same kind of truth to the material as they employ with wood. You know, the limitations and the blessings of the material. Yeah, what about the heads on some of the clay pieces? Kind of disconnected, you know, if you would look at them as, uh, you know, rating things formally, or is this a good sculpture or not? Um, you know, you might object to the, uh, the, you might have a feeling that a head, like like a Roman head, uh, you know, ancient Roman sculpture, as a lot of it's ended up in fragments and they've stuck heads from one piece onto bodies from other pieces. <laughs> um, I it, that um, I don't know that occurred to me as I was looking at these things, and yet it didn't bother. You, you know, it's a sort of formal objection, but it, completely irrelevant. Or you know, it did just didn't bother me at all. Mm. <laughs> The heads seem in tune with the rest of it. To me, they, they're in, like these little pointy hairdos are more peculiar. A lot, yeah. of, a lot of it is the hairdo. They did, you know, their hairs was, you know, it has a different texture and resilience. Yeah. And so the forms on the head are quite often covered by a particular um, coiffure, I think you say. Um, and that is also symbolic. The hairdos can be symbolic, which, you know, there's so much to learn. I'm still a rank outsider in knowledge. And the more you learn, you open up another book and suddenly it's full of more, more different, uh, these tribes that I'd never even heard of before. And it just astounds me, the amount of diversity in African sculpture, not, and even in this show in a certain yeah, way. Right, right, right. But the, the, we're looking at these seated figures and the pose is, uh, you know, there are a number of figures like this in this pose. Uh, and it made me think of the, uh, you know, Buddhas, mm -hmm. those cross-legged seated poses that are all over the place, you know, upstairs at the Met and in India and China and whatnot. And there's a variation on that seated pose and a variation so full of 
complex differences uh, and, uh, and, and, you know, I felt I had access to that. You know, I know how to sit like that, sort of cross-legged, but not really cross-legged. And I, I could, you know, those things were talking to me. Uh, yeah, I think they do. Yeah. I think, you know, that's one of the ways we respond to them is yeah. our knowledge of our own body. Well, yeah, you and, and uh, you know, I one of the questions I guess I have is, I uh, I wonder if Nicole Eisenman is was was familiar with these things before the show. Did she see the show? I, you know, that's a question on my mind. I was. Uh, most interested in the textiles and that one very small stone idol in like the um, at the very start of the show um, kind of uh, off to the left as you came in was it uh, the tiny one yeah the 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 small one in in the vitrine yeah. that one that was yeah. that one yeah that was found in Senegal uh -huh. Probably very old. That's complete, huh? It's a well. Um, from what I gather, what Elisa said about it is, it was a stone that was found, mm. and they recognised the human body in it, um, uh -huh. and emphasised it to some extent, and it suggests that it's both male and female in form. Yeah, the more so in the side views or the little bit of a back view comes well out. i think the whole form in the end could be considered phallic while it depicts the human body the the human yeah. female yeah you know thighs up to the neck kind of thing but it's a beautiful little thing and it's very old uh, do you happen to remember lee how old it is it's uh, it's i believe it's for, there, there, there was a date, and I don't have it with me at the moment. Uh -huh. But it, but it, it kind of echoes the Venus figures uh -huh. that exist, and I think it may be around that time. But I could be wrong. Yeah, yeah. I see it. It's one of, of those. Yeah, it certainly does echo those. Um, and 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 I, yeah, my my recollection, and maybe totally wrong here, is that it's significantly earlier than a lot of the other stuff we were that was right. yeah i believe so and there was a slender wood piece that you spoke of lee as being kind of uh atypical it kind of uh leans back and then forward ah it's the curvature in the wood that they found there it was just there there ah, yeah. yeah that's that's as in the branch or the, the tree trunk that they carved. Uh -huh. They go, you know, it, it's got that form because somebody decided to carve that piece of wood. Yeah. And they just adapt the form of the figure to it. But it's, it's kind of beautiful because of that. Yeah. yeah. And it was you a know? throwaway thing. It was so, uh, a post that was stuck in the ground to tie horses to or yeah. something. Hmm. Yeah, it seems that a few, uh, as Elisa said in her talk, that a few of them were found discarded in refuse piles. Yeah. Some of these things, you know, they've had their life, they've served their purpose, maybe beliefs changed a bit, and mm -hmm. they were discarded. Yeah, but now they mean something to us in the 21st century. Yeah, absolutely. Amazing. You know, it's, it's just wonderful. It, I think it's yeah. because we, we recognize the human condition. Yeah. Which I'm amazed how similar it is from 4000 BC to now. Yeah. That we're so much the same. I'm still astounded by that. Yeah. But that, that, I mean, I agree, Lee, but, but, our willingness to uh, to 
see what we like and take what we want facilitates that sensation as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. It does, but there we are. Um, but it was just as true for these people as it is for us. Yeah, I think so. What, 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 and when you spoke of um, the, 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 uh, their power to communicate <clears throat> to us, you know, at great distance, I, I asked myself if there was some element of their trade east to west, you know, from East Africa to West Coast Africa and beyond could have uh, fed that connection somehow. I'm sure. And there were migrations. Another thing that seems to happen with humans are migrations. They move. The whole tribe gets up and moves. And also a lot of the influence was coming over, over the Sahara, the trades. Of oh, north to south. North yeah. to south, yeah. Mm -hmm. And around the Sahara. Yeah. You know, down the east side and across to the west. And that's evidenced in artifacts and things. You can see the uh, Islamic influence. There's a beautiful gold disc um, that was featured in this show, and that showed a considerable Islamic influence. I didn't realize that a vast amount of the world's gold at that, at, through those times was coming out of the Sahel. I didn't wow. know they were so wealthy in gold. Mm. It's something I've kind of learned from this show. OK. Um... I think that's been a very a, a good good exchange. Anybody want the last word? Lee, you might like the last word. Well, I think there's a lot. You deserve the last word. I deserve, I think I've been saying too much, but there we are. Um, I just absolutely find a pleasure and a joy which elevates me in seeing these these little guys here, you know, it's ju I just find it very enriching. Um, and for, for, for me, having them around me, every now and again, you look at one and suddenly you see it anew, um, having a piece at home. And I think that's lovely as well. And that happens with art that's being produced now as well. So I don't know. This yeah. is a very, I thought it was a wonderful show. I um, saw the uh, reliquy show, the Fang reliquy. Yeah. And um, with you. Yeah. And that's still very powerful in my mind. So I think we're just very lucky to be getting someone um, as informed, putting on this fantastic work from Africa and other countries now. I, 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 it's I, better. I, I, I agree with that. I, I just want to say in closing that some of these things I found really quite scary. Perfect. All right. Thank you, everybody.